our next speaker is uh, Catherine Greco from uh, Eindhoven University of Te uh, Technology. Uh, yeah, that's where I come. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about how we can uh, deterministically design electrodes for redox flow batteries and thereby enable these technologies to be used for grid scale energy storage. But first, I want to talk a little bit about why we want to use redox flow batteries specifically. So we're facing a challenge as we're upgrading our current grid infrastructure from primarily coal and other fossil fuels. Um, we're beginning to add more renewable energy sources like sun and solar and wind. And this is great um, because we're reducing our carbon uh, emissions. However, these resources are intermittent. And so there's no guarantee that the sun will be shining or the wind will be blowing when there's a demand for energy. And so to solve this problem, we need to use energy storage. But what further compounds this problem is that there's different time scales of intermittency. So it's not just on a daily scale. So this chart is showing uh, the hourly variability of both wind and solar, as well as the load, um, which is demand for energy in Texas over the entire year of 2014. And so you can really clearly see each day um, by this red solar, um, these red solar capacity charges. Uh, this is the diurnal cycle, so the sun will be rising and setting. Um, and there's also more uh, variable uh, intermittency in the wind. Um, so these both are varying on the daily scale. And so this would be a short-term uh, intermittency on the uh, scale of seconds to hours. But we also have longer-term um, intermittency. So for example, if we look at the first week of January, you can see that, let's see if I can use this pointer. OK. So you can see. Alrighty. All right. So looking at the first week of January, you can see that for the first few days, it seems that we're able to meet our entire load, um, which is the demand, with almost entirely renewable energy sources. But further on in the week, um, you can see that there are a few days where we don't manage to meet this demand. And so this would be a mid-duration intermittency, which is on the scale of hours to days. And we also have much longer-term intermittency. So if you look at the entire month of June, it seems that uh, for many of the days, much of the month, we are meeting our load with entirely renewable sources. But there's also, if you can consider um, September, there's many days when we're not. And so this is longer term uh, intermittency on the order of weeks or months. And so currently, we have different energy storage technologies for each of these different durations. So for short durations, lithium ion is a really great choice. Um, because it can discharge quickly. And so we um, can really meet variability in either wind or solar in real time. For longer term duration on the scale of months, we can use pumped hydro. And so this um, pumped hydro has a lot of storage capacity, but you need time to be able to pump the water uh, to a higher energy state. And so for mid duration, what really um, we're proposing would be a great technology are redox flow batteries. And the reason that is that redox flow batteries are scalable when you compare them to lithium ion. So if you look at a lithium ion or any other solid state battery, you can't scale the energy and power independently. So if you want to change the energy or the power, you have to scale the entire um, system. But a redox flow battery, you store your electrolyte independently of the, rea um, the reactor. And so if you want to change your energy or the discharge duration, you change this, um, the volume of your electrolyte. And if you want to change the power, you can just increase the scale of your reactor. And so because these energy and power are scalable, this makes them ideal for longer term um, energy storage. And so the, in fact, as we look at longer term discharge duration, the cost of redox flow batteries decreases um, significantly. So here, uh, the future state for lithium ion on the lower estimate is estimated to be about $100 per kilowatt hour. And this doesn't change as a function of discharge duration, because as you increase discharge duration of lithium ion cells, you're just adding more cells. Um, but for a redox flow battery, you're changing, you're increasing the size of your electrolyte tank. And so as you increase your discharge duration, uh, we have the possibility to have significantly lowered costs. Um, and so this enables them for longer term energy storage. And so now quickly, I'll talk about the different components of a redox flow battery. So first, as I mentioned, the electrolyte is stored externally of the reactor. And so this is composed of an active species that is either charged or discharged. If there's a supporting electrolyte, which improves conductivity of your system, and there's a solvent. And typically, this can be water or other organic solvents. Next, if we look at the reactor, what separates the positive and the negative side of the cell is the ion exchange membrane. And so this will allow your active, this will inhibit um, transport of your active species while allowing your supporting electrolyte to pass through. 
Um, because the electrolyte is in a liquid phase, we can use a flow field um, to manipulate flow of the electrolyte into your porous electrode. And as for the porous electrode itself, this is typically carbon fibers um, and that have this porous structure that allow your electrolyte to pass through. And you also have diffusion of your active species to and from the surface. Um, and so there's several advantages of this architecture. So as I previously mentioned, this decoupled energy and power scaling. They're also fairly simple to manufacture and they're highly durable and they have low maintenance because you have the electrolyte and reactor stored separately. So it's very easy to go into the reactor and do maintenance. They're also locationally independent as opposed to pumped hydro. And so currently the state of the art technology for flow batteries is vanadium. And so the way a vanadium redox flow battery works is on the positive side you have vanadium four and vanadium five. And on the negative side you have vanadium two and vanadium three. And so uh, the redox couple gives you about a 1.3 volt cell voltage. Um, and so an advantage of this system is that because it's just the system is entirely vanadium, if you have crossover of active species, you have self-discharge, but that capacity is recoverable because you can simply remix the electrolytes and start again. Um, and because vanadium is dissolved in aqueous electrolyte, this does limit our cell voltage a little bit, um, but because um, aqueous is le much less toxic and more easily available, um, this is still considered an advantage. Disadvantages of vanadium is that the vanadium itself is an expensive active material. And so um, we need to, if we're gonna decrease the cost of these systems, we need to look at the other um, parts of the reactor to um, find cost savings. Additionally, vanadium has very sluggish redox kinetics. And so we need to um, improve the electrodes, uh, the electrode activity towards the vanadium redox reaction to improve performance. And so one of the most common ways that people um, imp treat or pr improve electrodes for the vanadium redox reaction is by thermal pretreatment. So a very standard pretreatment for carbon fiber electrodes is to um, oxidize them at 400 degrees Celsius for 30 hours under an air atmosphere. And simply by doing this, we can see a large improvement in power density. So if we compare pretreated electrodes to that of a pristine untreated electrode, we can see a large increase in power density simply by thermally pretreating these electrodes. And so the reason for these improvements in performance is that um, these pretreating the electrodes um, influences many different of the properties of these electrodes. And so there are several different properties that we found to influence performance. So performance is a function of the electrochemically active surface area of the electrode. And so this is a little bit different than um, the actual physical surface area because not every site on the electrode is actually um, redox active. So we wanted to make sure that as much of the electrode as possible is active towards your redox reaction. Surface functionalization has also been shown to play a role in vanadium redox reactions. And so adding surface functional groups like oxygen will improve your reaction kinetics. Additionally, uh, pre-treating the electrodes will change the wetting of these um, materials. If you have an electrode that is not entirely wet, then you're not accessing all of your surface area. And so and ensuring that the electrode completely wets your electrolyte will thereby increase your effective surface area. And so the goal is to maximize all of these different uh, electrode properties to achieve the optimal performance. And so we can think about doing this in a two-step approach. So similarly to how um, the A plus B conference is inspired by using current technologies A, and by enabling future technologies B, we can also take this approach with electrodes. So we can start by optimizing properties of the existing electrodes, these carbon fibers, and we can also move on to taking what we learned from this study to design new electrodes that are specifically um, designed for redox flow battery applications. And so first, we tried to use step A. And so we varied different thermal pretreatment temperatures, trying to induce changes in all of the properties that I've talked about. So trying to um, change surface functionalization, improve hydrophilicity, as well as increase surface area. And so now I'll just quickly go through um, the results that we have for each of these properties. So first we use X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to look at the um, surface functionalization of these electrodes. And so we found that as you increase pretreatment temperature, um, compared to the pristine case, you increase surface functionalization. So you're adding more oxygen functional groups to your surface. And so this should improve your uh, redox kinetics. Next, if we look at the hydrophilicity of the electrodes, um, we can do this with external contact angle measurements. And so you can imagine that there can be three cases. So first, you can have the case where the electrode is hydrophobic, and so it resists wetting. And like you would show a contact angle of a, a greater than 90 degrees. The second case is your electrode can show hydrophilic behavior, and your contact angle will be less than 90 degrees. You can also have a case where, because this is a porous surface, it spontaneously imbibes electrode. And so this would be a super hydrophilic case. 
So first, if we start with pristine electrodes, we can see that these show hydrophobic behavior. Pre-treating them at 400 degrees Celsius um, induces hydrophilicity. And as we further increase pretreatment temperature, we see that the electrodes spontaneously imbibe water. But we can still compare the hydrophilicity by looking at the rate of imbibition. So if we compare electrodes at 425 degrees Celsius to that of electrodes at 450 degrees Celsius, you can see that the electrodes at, four, or sorry, I'm sorry, 500 degrees Celsius, you can see that higher pretreated electrodes uh, wet both farther and faster than those treated at 425 degrees Celsius. And so we're further improving hydrophilicity as we increase pretreatment temperature. And so finally, we can put these two um, properties together and look at the estimated electrochemically active surface area of our electrodes. So if we start with pristine in the bottom left, um, it has a very low electrochemically active surface area. And we can greatly increase um, our ECSA simply by pretreating at 400 degrees Celsius. And so we attribute this to increased functional groups as well as wetting of the surface. As we further increase pretreatment temperatures, we see a decrease in electrochemically active surface area. And so this decreases because as we continue to oxidize our electrodes, although we are adding more functional groups and improving hydrophilicity, we're simply losing mass. And so there's not as much at, uh, material for the electrolyte to react with. Um, and so the summary is that there's these competing properties. We want electrodes to be hydrophilic and have high oxygen content, but we also want them to have, have high electrochemically active surface area. And so we can summarize the results of these different parameters as a function of pretreatment temperature. As I just showed, if you increase pretreatment temperature, you're decreasing your electrochemically active surface area, but you're improving properties like oxygen content and hydrophilicity. And so the next step is to see how all of these different properties have an effect on cell performance. And so we put these electrodes in an actual vanadium flow battery. And so if we compare the power of um, pristine electrodes to that of 400 degrees Celsius, we see an improvement as we would expect. As we continue to increase pretreatment temperature, we actually improve our performance more, and this is due to adding more oxygen groups. But then if we go to 500 degrees Celsius, these actually perform worse than the pristine case. And this is because we simply lost too much surface area. And so we have to achieve some balance between these properties. So as hydrophilicity and oxygen content increased, initially we improved performance. But then as we decreased electrochemical active surface area, our cell performance dropped off. And so for carbon paper electrodes, there exists this trade-off between important properties. And so the next step is to design electrodes that don't have this property, and so that they, which, or that they should show desirable traits, and so we can continue to improve performance. And so we've begun to do that by transitioning to other types of electrodes. So specifically, we're looking at nickel foam electrodes. So nickel foam, um, in its pristine form, has about 100 micron pore size. And so this is rather large, but this is good because it induces flow. And so we want to be able to increase the surface area of these electrodes. And so we've done that using alloying and de-alloying. So we deposit a copper nickel alloy onto the surface of the electrode. And then we um, corrode the copper away. And we're left with a deposit of nickel foam. And so this has a bimodal pore distribution. It has these 100 micron pores uh, structure. But on the surface, it has these smaller 1 micron pores. And so this increases your surface area. And so we, if we look at these, um, a pristine nickel foam compared to a deposited nickel foam, and we estimate the electrochemically active surface area, we found that the deposited nickel foam has a doubling increase in electrochemically active surface area. And so this is a work in progress, but our goal is to continue to look at new electrode materials that we can use to enable next generation flow batteries. And so I'll just quickly conclude by saying that uh, we found that electrode properties, including surface functionalization, surface area, and wetting, have been shown to influence battery performance. Uh, and if we can understand and optimize the effect of this pretreatment on electrode performance, um, then we can maximize performance of our existing electrodes. But to really enable um, further improvements in performance for flow batteries, we need to design electrodes from the bottom up. And this will enable us to uh, further decrease costs. And so finally, I'd just like to thank the Brusha Research Group, um, some of whom have came to support me. Um, I'd also like to thank my advisor, Fick Brushett, and Tony Forner, who is my co-author on this work. Uh, and specifically from the Brusha Group, I'd like to thank Kevin, Charles, and Jane, as well as my funding sources. And thank you all so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for the very nice talk. So uh, any question from the audience? Right, so, so others have done this work, um, and they have shown improved performance, definitely. So like, there are other fancier treatments. From, so thermal treatment is the most common, 
But other works have looked into like ozone or using acid, and they've also shown to improve performance for sort of the same reason, like you're adding oxygen groups and increasing the surface area. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Viability between the nickel foam right. and your process? Is it slow? Is it expensive? Right, that's a good question. So I think, so nickel would be um, more expensive, I believe, than carbon. But the problem is that if you look at capital costs alone, it doesn't really tell the whole story. So as you improve performance, you are decreasing your costs. So you uh, would need to do like a more in depth techno-economic analysis to assess to what point you need to get your performance to make these electrodes viable. Um, so we don't know yet. Any other question? Sure, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, if I'm wrong, but if I have referenced that the main problem is redox color battery is that lack of pressure drop on the electrolyte and the surface mm. of the mm -hmm. electrolyte. Uh, how it can affect your uh, specific activity of your uh, surface of your electrode? So it was, sorry, I'm just going to repeat it to make sure I understood. So you're saying that pressure drop through the electrode itself? Yes. Yeah. So that is a that is a problem. Um, I think that we've it's been um, solved because pr previously uh, what people were using were these really thick nickel or sorry carbon um, carbon cloth. No cloth. What is it called? I'm sorry. F sorry, carbon felt electrodes that were like one or two millimeters thick. Um, we've transitioned to carbon papers, and so these are much thinner. And you can also use different types of flow fields. Um, to reduce pressure. So um, in our, our system is pretty small. It's like uh, one and a half centimeters tall. But as you scale, um, as if you switch to a, a thinner electrode and like a different design, so instead of having a flow field where you're forcing all of your electrolyte in, you can have a flow field where um, it goes through the channel mostly and then just diffuses into the electrode. You can um, pretty much solve that problem. But yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? So I have a related question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so Tesla has a power pack based on lithium-ion battery mm -hmm. technology. Do you think that's a barrier for the practical application of uh, the flow battery technique? Yeah, so I think that goes back to um, the scalability argument. So I think a power pack is great for um, our charge and discharge. So you can maybe, if you have a power pack in your home and a solar panel on your roof, during the day you can charge electricity and then discharge it at night. But what about when you have a cloudy week or a cloudy month? I think that's when a flow battery would come in. Um, so I think the, the problem is that other people have been trying, or the redox flow battery field has been trying to convince people that, oh, we're better than lithium ion, but they're just different. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I have one more question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, if you treated your samples at 500 degrees C, you actually see the performance decrease. Mm -hmm. You attribute that to uh, a reduction in the surface area. What, what's the reason for that? Um, so I didn't show it today, um, but if you look at the mass of the electrodes, um, at first, if you pre-treat them at 400 and 425, you have like a pretty stable, it's almost pristine, but at, at 500 degrees Celsius, the mass is almost halved. And if you pick up, in the lab, if you pick up these electrodes, they're almost falling apart. So you really just oxidize a lot of your surface. Combustion. It's combustion, exactly, it's combustion. Maybe like a flash pyrolysis or something, because I'm assuming this is a really long time at right. 500. Maybe flash and so you just right. surface Yeah, you that's a really good question. So that's actually sort of what I've been working on lately um, is to try to see. There's been some thoughts that 30, degrees, 30 hours is unnecessary and that you add all the oxygen in the first hour or something like that. So that's something we're trying to see, like what are, what are the limits or what do you actually need to do? Because 30 hours is kind of a long time, definitely. Um. OK, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, so let me correct. Uh, okay. Catherine is a MIT student. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>